My name's Will Clark. Um, I'm just going to talk to you quite briefly now today. I thought we might be doing this a bit earlier um, about how you can start to build on top of um, LND specifically um, using its gRPC interface. Um, the focus is also going to be on Python today. However, as I'm going to sort of explain to you, part of the beauty of the gRPC, if you're not familiar with it, is that it allows this cross compatibility between different languages. So, if Python's not really your thing and you come away from today knowing, understanding how it all works, then you should be able to apply, hopefully, some of the knowledge in, into the language of your choice. So, some of the things that I want to cover. Uh, although they're not necessarily in this order in the presentation, are the LND RPC environment, just the kind of things that LND is expecting to hear from its side, from its servers. Um, a bit of background on gRPC itself, what is the gRPC, um, some of the concepts involved and also some of the terminology. Um, and then lastly, a little bit about the LND gRPC Python package specifically, uh, which, is which is one which I've been writing, and just some of its capabilities and limitations. And um, then in the workshop, we'll go a bit deeper into actually the, the use of it um, and looking at some of the things it can do. So, I'm not going to stay on this slide very long because I think we all have, at this stage, you can't help but write it at the beginning, you think it's going to be useful, but I think we all are happy with, with why you might choose Lightning, perhaps, um, over Bitcoin. It's good for, obviously, the sort of applications like the hold invoices that Yoast just talked about, but also um, low value payments and, and high frequency payments is something that are possible as well, although they, they, ca they do have some caveats. So why might you choose LND as your specific brand of Lightning software? Uh, well, it's written in Go, so it's very highly concurrent, uh, which can be yeah, pretty useful. Um, and they're often at the forefront of new kind of protocol level and node level features. Um, so some of these things, like I mean, like you, you just said, the hold invoices, that's kind of an agreement between two nodes really, there's nothing, there's no consensus mechanisms at work here, nobody else on the network is going to disagree with them, but if those two nodes agree with each other, then they can implement new and interesting features, and LND seem to implement quite a lot of these quite quickly and quite early, so you've got like submarine swaps, um, the loop out we talked about, hold invoices, Sphinx payments, which I think is, might have been rebranded to, to, to key sends, um, so that's, that's pay to public key. Um, uh, atomic multipath payments as well, used to also just covered. So, another uh, sort of a poignant reason for today's session is because it uses Google's gRPC interface, that's how their, their RPC interface works. Um, as I just mentioned, it, it works seamlessly between many languages. There's a whole list of them up there. C++, Java, Python, Ruby, Node.js, C Sharp, Go. Um, I think all but one or two of these are uh, available to the LND client. But this, this kind of lets you um, write and your software in the language if you're choosing. And they can work on different devices. This could be you could be writing on uh, you know, Android, Java for a, a tablet or something, just the same as somebody could be writing in C++ for a server. Um, they can all talk to LND um, very nicely. So the reason that can happen behind the scenes is because Google's gRPC is leveraging their protocol buffers, um, which are used to do all the serialization and deserialization of the data and the various messages between all the languages, so Google's kind of done that, that hard work for you. Um, you know, lots of the, the stuff you did with Justin yesterday was the serializing and deserializing of bytes on the network, you know, and that's, as, you, as you saw, there's quite a lot to it. Um, but that's all kind of handled for you by uh, leveraging this Google's uh, protocol buffers. So this is uh, just a quote from their actual website as to what gRPC is, um, and uh, they define it as being based around the idea of defining a service, 
specifying the methods that can be called remotely with their parameters and return types. Um, yeah, and they use, they use protocol buffers as the interface definition language for both for describing both the service interface and the structure of the messages. Um, so what that means is you you can define your services um, in a single protocol file, and from there you can then generate uh, additional files in the language of either the server or the client you're trying to create um, automatically. So you don't have to create code and you know the, they don't have to create code in all these different languages basically to support them all. So to talk about these um, quickly just uh, a little bit more, the GRP services as they're called, um, so you define those services as messages um, in the proto file, they're pretty simple, um, they've got one or more uniquely numbered fields um, and each field has got a name and a type and types can be like numbers, whether integers or floating point values, balls, strings, uh, even raw bytes or other protocol messages themselves. Um, you can also specify if fields are optional or required or if they are repeated fields and uh, some of the, the data returned by LND is, is in uh, different fields of those types. So once you've defined your uh, proto file for the RPC server, you can uh, compile it into the, uh, once you've defined the proto file, you can compile it into the server language, which is uh, Go for LND. It's a little link to the script which they provide to, to do that in their GitHub repository. Um, all, the, all, the, all that's happening, can you see the mouse? No. All that's happening in the script is you're using Google's Proto C package um, to translate that all into Go, a Go compatible, um, basically Go compatible classes and uh, everything else. Um, creating the client definitions, which in this case is uh, we're going to do for Python, or it's already included in the library, but you basically do a very similar thing. Um, using the proto package for that language. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what I just read out. So how to make a client. Um, yeah, you gener generate the, the definitions uh, in the same way. For Python, you can use the um, Python grpc tools proto c uh, module and specify which protocol buffers to use. Then they've got the directory you want to output to is the is the um, second two parameters and finally the protocol the RPC proto input that you you want to convert um, and that that generates all your messages in the in the language of your choosing um, and kind of I guess the reason which I wanted to explain this is because if you are talking to LND using these protocol buffers and they release um, an update say with a new feature which might be included as a new message or a new a whole new service then you'll have to get this uh, the RPC proto file and regenerate all of your definitions for the language which you're of your choice which you're trying to use so it just seemed kind of useful to mention it really um, so yeah, compatible languages with LND server, I think, as I, which they declare anyway. I believe some of the other ones might work, but the, the ones they declare are C++, Go, Node.js, Java, Ruby, Android Java, PHP, Python, C Sharp, and Objective-C. So loads of languages can all talk with the one RPC server, which is quite nice. Um, so yeah. The generated files which you get out when you when you do run this in Python end in that at pb2.py and uh, pb2 underscore grpc.py and they contain these um, stubs as they're called and different services and all the methods and messages needed to communicate um, with the server. So services, what do we mean by services? Well they are 
defined by the server and accept different RPC requests. In LMD, they're divided up sort of logically into subservers. I think that's the correct term. I'm not sure. I know they have uh, subsystems. is slightly different. I think they call them subservers. So you've got the um, sort of standard LNRPC one, which contains the wallet unlocker, which is the uh, unlock wallet commands, which uh, some of you might have seen, and uh, init wallet. So you can do a couple of actions to the LND node before you've unlocked the wallet, in which opens the rest of the, uh, the actions up to you. Um, and they've got the invoices RPC, which is for HODL invoices that, that Eust was talking about. Um, there are a couple of other subservers, but they're lesser used in my experience. Um, and then you've got stubs, so you've got services and stubs. Um, and a stub basically functions as the client, and it's how you package and send your RPC requests to the server, and what will receive the responses for you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Services and stubs need to have methods with the same names and parameters so that they know how to talk to each other. So, a quick look at the methods available. So, uh, this, the stub just sends typical messages. What is the stub? Yeah, the, the stub will be uh, is the GRPC way of packaging a, a, a message and sending it to the server and then receiving the response and you know doing the serialization and deserialization because that will happen behind the scenes for you. Um, so a quick look at the, the four different type of methods because these are these are relevant because these are the four different um, types. Well, in fact, not four. I think LND is only using three. These are the different types or functions, effectively, that your client is going to be running. And so um, you've got unary, which is one request and one response. So things like uh, wallet balance will be a unary um, service method. You're just asking it for the balance. It, in one request and it's sending one response. You've got server streaming, which is where you make one, one request to the server and it sends you back a stream of responses. Um, that could be things like subscribing to various updates or uh, even some of the asynchronous open channels, stuff like that. Um, you've got the opposite client streaming where the client sends a stream of requests and gets one response back. I don't believe they're using that for any methods at the moment. Could be mistaken, I don't think so. And then bi-directional streams, uh, which is where you effectively send two stream, one stream each to each other, and um, that, that's things like uh, send to payment, in fact, or, or pay invoices using a bi-directional stream. So quickly on the sort of life cycles, I guess it's just a bit more detail into how these work but it, it kind of shows where the error codes might come from in case you see error codes, which you do sometimes. Um, by the way, if, any, if this is too small, I will make the slides like available some other way to, to people so you can have a look at them. So yeah, you don't, you don't generally see the status codes and um, the error codes unless things goes wrong. You'll, the GRPC kind of depackages those in the background, but um, some of the streaming requests you can check on their status while they're while they're still like alive. But generally, I think when you get a message back, then uh, it's either success or fail. But yeah, so for Unary, you know, you do the single request, you get a response, and the server will will send the response and the status code back to you. The server streaming is pretty similar, um, except it serves, sends a stream of responses, and um, the client streaming. It kind of has to presume when. Do we need to? Are we swapping? It kind of needs to presume when the end of your requests are, um, and that's another thing that can go get out of, out of sync really in in GRPC, in GRPC stuff if your application itself is not coded particularly well. And then for the bi-directional streams, yeah, they, they initialize a connection and then they can read and write messages in any order between themselves. It's up to you to decide how you're going to ensure that the responses and requests match up together. So I'm going to try and whiz through these. Um, 
deadlines and timeouts, you can put deadlines and timeouts on the RPC stuff. Again, this can be quite handy if you want some of the calls are blocking. So uh, you might want to put a timeout on the call. For example, if you try and connect to a peer and you don't know how long it's going to take to connect, or maybe it never will and it will, it will hang. Um, then you've got success. Again, that's sort of up to the user or of the, the well, the, the programmer of the code to write to codify what they mean by success for a, for a single RPC call. Um, the server might think that it's succeeded and be finished, and the client might be expecting something else. You know, you can again get all out of out of sync. It's technically possible to cancel RPCs, but you can't undo them. So. Metadata. Um, metadata is basically any extra info associated with the call. Um, a typical use case is authentication for the call. Obviously, you don't want people to be able to come through your RPC port and command your node to do stuff. Um, you want some kind of authentication. Um, and there's two types, uh, really, on a gRPC level. There's channel credentials and call credentials. Um, LND for the channel credentials is using the SSH channel credentials, which is baked into gRPC itself. And for the call credentials, which are included on a per call basis, um, this is where the, the macaroons come in. I guess everyone's heard of the macaroons. If you've used LND, you find all these macaroons everywhere, different, different named macaroons. And, um, Does anyone not know what a macaroon is? Okay. Don't worry, I've got a slide. Oh, I'm okay. going through it. We're going to get through all of it. <laughs> macaroons part of. You get these things like macaroons. You can tell they're named a bit like cookies. So they might be like a cookie, but maybe they're tastier or better. Who knows? They come in more colours. <laughs> so um, what you do is you, to make things simpler, you can combine these, luckily, these channel credentials and call credentials into a single um, composite channel credentials. Uh, so let's have a look at macaroons. Yeah, similar to cookies. And they're interesting because you can create them with um, different, different properties. Um, a good one is, is limited capabilities. For example, uh, you can make macaroons which can only generate invoices or could only run a single RPC. Um, or in fact, oh, here's some macaroons, yeah. Um, you can send them around to other people as well, which I guess you might be able to do with a cookie. But yeah, you could, you could, I could generate a macaroon for my node, and then and then send it to one of you guys, uh, and then somebody else could use that that macaroon. Um, you can also restrict access using caveats, so you can have a macaroon which expires at a certain time, or you can have macaroons even that are locked to a specific IP address, um, which again just helps with security. And uh, it, yeah, they, they're, they're just quite an appropriate system, I guess, for use in a decentralized distributed system um, for, for controlling sharing of any node functionality. You, know? you don't have to rely on any third party saying who can do what, and you can, you can share access to, to different properties of the node. Um, they are a bit sensitive though, and you should only send them over encrypted channels, uh, which is, is kind of why LND uses TLS for the RPC commands. Um, if an attacker gets your macaroon, he can do whatever you could do with it, so you've got to kind of be quite careful with them. So how do we use? There's a question before. Macaroons are defined within the gRPC, or like? No, no, no. They're, they're an external. They're like a third party. You can bring your own authentication to gRPC. So you could do that. Google's OAuth, or you could do whatever you can implement. Really, it just depends what's your server expecting to see, and what it, can your client generate, and then you know pack it into one end and look for it on the other end, basically. So macaroons just are. Um, yeah, they're quite a lot more flexible, obviously. Bitcoin Core has like a username and password, or they're trying to get rid of that. I think it's like a hashed password now. Um, and macaroons just, yeah, there's some there's some interesting macaroons. I think it generates about five or six macaroons now. Um, 
So one of the ones which I've seen somebody use um, is like a decentralized tipping service. So you upload your invoice macaroon and your node's IP address and RPC port, which kind of sounds dangerous, but all the invoices macaroon lets you do is generate new invoices. So then when somebody comes on their service and they want to tip you, they can literally generate a new invoice from your node and they pay directly to you, which is quite cool. So there's lots of stuff like that that they open up different opportunities to. Um, yeah, so I guess the two main things to know about macaroons is that they are generated automatically by LND. I think there's something called like the bakery that generates them when you start up LND. Um, and if you upgrade at LND, and any of the macaroons need a change or some of the permissions on the server might change. There's been a few times with breaking changes to various of the macaroons, but it's pretty safe just to delete all the dot macaroon files you can find uh, after closing LND and then restart it and as soon as you unlock the wallet new macaroons will be baked for you. Which is um, it's quite cool. Any, the only thing that you would lose in that case is any remote services that had a copy of the old macaroon. Still, obviously, they need to, to get a new copy of it. And that's only when there's new macaroon permissions. Are there any other upgrades when you would need to? Obviously, if they expand, if they expanded the permissions as well. So, if they if they added a new feature that your macaroon didn't have support for it, you, you might need to regenerate But what about upgrades that aren't macaroon specific? Um, you would then always actually, be able to maintain the yeah, existing macaroons? that could work. Um, there's one called admin macaroon. I don't know if that explicitly lists every feature that it can do or whether the restrictions are in the other ones saying what it can't do. I don't know. So maybe the admin macaroon keeps working with full permissions. I'm not entirely sure. I just know that there's, you can't influence them too much um, and it, it, it generates them automatically when you start up. So if, you, if, you wanna, if you need to reset, just delete them all and go again. They're not that sensitive. So channels, I kind of mentioned channels briefly. These contain all the connection details, um, which is basically the host and the port and the combined credential metadata. This opens up a, a channel to your uh, the RPC port of your LND node. Um, they're kind of they're used to create the client stub. They've got state that can be monitored and um, they can take various arguments to enable and disable features and options. Um, there was some point at the middle of this year where the, the graph got a, a little bit too large for LND to be able to communicate with the, the message size they had. So we now need to set you know, these gRPC.max send message length. That's had to be increased. I thought I had in there what it's been increased to, but um, yeah, a couple of the, the commands were starting not to work, actually the RPC commands, because the message length was too long. Not going to run through that, but these are the different states channels can have. They can be connecting, ready, transient failure, idle, or shutdown. They each mean different things, and they can annoyingly mean different things depending on which state you've come from. But um, you can, you can, the way you can write your your library or your code is to monitor the channel for connectivity and and you know try and reconnect if connectivity goes down and do various things. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm just going to skip, go past that one. So how do we connect to the server? This is a basic connection just to make it look a bit simpler. Um, you can see it's using grpc.insecure channel, so it's not packing the combined credentials in there which you would need for, for LND. Um, you basically initiate, you create a channel object, um, and then from that channel you can create your stub. Um, then calling a method really is, is kind of easy from that point you just obviously you need your generated definitions um, you create a request which will be you've taken the open channel request from your if you remember the rpc underscore pb2.py is one of the definition files we generated from the proto file 
Um, so once you've got that, we create, we're, we're pulling uh, an in the open channel request from that um, and passing in a pub key and an amount. And then once you send, uh, use that method on the stub and passing in the request, you'll get your result out. So um, it's kind of easy. It's, it's, it sort of seems tricky, but that's not, that's not really too much to it. So let's dive in and have a look at some code examples, and then we'll make sure we've got a bit of time to do a workshop. Because I think when you actually use it, it it'll seem hopefully a little bit less confusing. So we're going to quickly look at this Python um, library, LNDGRPC, which, is, which I've been making myself. Um, and I guess half the function of that library is to abstract away most of what I've just explained before. All the GRPC stuff um, is sort of behind the scenes, and you have a whole library of nice Python functions which do exactly as you might expect them to most of the time. Um, there's a couple of other versions out, there's, there's even one or two other Python ones, but uh, Alex Bosworth's JavaScript one, I think, is very fully functional, so if anyone is a JavaScript, prefers JavaScript, then um, definitely take a look at that. It's got a lot of extra tools and features included with it as well, but uh, this one's working quite well at the moment, reasonably well. So I just want to... Yeah, walk through kind of what it's doing behind the scenes a little bit, move on to some small code examples, and um, then we'll use it in the workshop so everyone can get really familiar. Uh, the requirements for it, well, we've already done the first bit of the workshop, so everyone knows it's pretty nice and small. You basically just need LND and Python greater than 3.6. Obviously, if you want to run your own node, then you, you're going to need that as well. Um, but that's it, so that's pretty nice and easy. It does have a couple of dependencies. I think there's about yeah, a handful of dependencies as well. But Yeah, so the whole point is to take care of most of the gRPC details for you um, and also provide all the RPC methods in, in nice classes. Um, it doesn't do any error handling. I wanted the errors to make sure that people got their errors. I thought about doing some error handling, but I think it's nicer to try and know what, why your code might have failed. Um, what do you mean? Uh, well, you could wrap the errors up and you can... You can I did in terms some, of providing different messages? I think it's nice to get the raw RPC error <coughs> flowed all the way up to the user. So it doesn't do any error handling at all. If you try and make a, an invalid RPC call, you'll get exactly what the LND servers return to you. Because I have seen some other ones where they where they hand, handle the errors and you know try reconnections and try five times for you with a timeout and stuff. But I haven't taken any choices to do that basically. You're happy with the error messages that you get from LND? No, they could, be, <laughs> they, could they could be improved a little bit. They're all, they're all right when you start. They're a bit cryptic. That's all I'll say at the beginning. You you do get used to them. Um, so just looking at how you would uh, instantiate a class, again, something we've already kind of covered. Um, you just basically need to import the client class. Uh, it takes six, uh, I think they're all optional um, arguments. If you, if you just run client itself, it will try and search for the LND directory based on your system architecture and where it thinks the default should be on your system. And if it can find it, then it will find the macaroon and the, the TLS certificate and stuff like that. It'll look on Bitcoin on mainnet by default. So again, if you're using another coin, I doubt it. But or um, yeah, testnet or reg test or something like that. Then you need to pass that into the network. Um, and it does include those gRPC options for the maximum message length, message length by default as well. So the macaroons, yeah, this is just a, a snapshot of the code that, that locates and opens the macaroon. They're stored um, as bytes, so you just read that as hex. And um, creates a little callback to transparently create the call credentials needed to authenticate each RPC call. Again, that's, it's doing that for you in the background, which is hopefully nice to not have to implement that kind of stuff. 
Um, this is it combining the, the SSL channel credentials and the, um, the macaroons in the core credentials and then creating a stub. So this is the stub which you, you get back, um, combining all of those things together. <laughs> um, there was some question about whether a stub should be created for every RPC call. I think some people like that because then they're always fresh. I've tried to implement some logic where the stub will only get regenerated if the channel changes state from connecting to iron, but there could be some bugs to iron out with that. Um, it does make it very much faster to do RPC calls though, persisting a channel, so yeah, persisting a stub. So yeah, this is just a quick example of a call. Again, pretty much like that. The example I showed earlier, you just create the request by um, getting a wallet balance request from those generated definitions. Uh, you, you then create a response by calling wallet balance method on the lightning stub and passing the request in, and it'll return the response to you. So it's, it's some of them are, most of them are pretty simple like that. Um, yeah. It's just the, uh, the metadata callback making stuff a bit easier. So all of the LND RPCs are implemented at the moment. They can all be found on this website, which I think maybe most of you have opened up from the um, <coughs> workshop file now as well. It's a good resource. You can It's got some Python examples for most of them. You can see all of the uh, parameters that they expect and everything that you can expect to be returned. So if I look there, and if I see the call, I can convert it from exact case to snake case. Exactly, yeah. Run it with your yeah. library. Yeah, or yeah. lowercase with underscores. Yeah. So they're all in there, and um, provided <coughs> you've got the same, the same proto file uh, from the same version as, I think their documentation is automatically generated on that site. Yeah. Uh, then all the all the all the. Uh, arguments and stuff will be the same as well. Yeah. But they don't get converted. They need to be passed in exactly the same. Yeah. Um, again, if you're, if you're using this library in particular, it's just a design decision on my part. The streaming response streaming RPCs uh, return the Python iterators themselves for you to decide what to do with. So um, I think if you, again, if you're on that website, lots of the code examples just say to print for response in responses, you know, print response. But these you you'll get the iterator back yourself, and you've got to iterate over it and decide what you want to do with it. Um, yeah, most of the uh, most of the RPCs which do take some arguments also take a, a keywords argument dictionary. I found this is quite helpful because if they add new features to LND which you've got on your version of LND and I haven't updated this, you can update the, the protocol file and still use this library just fine because it will just pass in the, the, argu the new argument as a keyword argument, so it can be quite useful as well. Handy thing to know maybe. So yeah, here's just a little picture in case anyone didn't go on the website. It, it, it's a nice clear reference uh, and it shows you, you can see in the red square, that's a request with no parameters, and then at the bottom I should expect to get back a <coughs> wallet balance response object with, with three um, different attributes. So that's that's good to use in conjunction with the uh, with the library itself. That's really the key, I would say. So threading. Um, so the, the back end server is fully async enabled, I, th I think it's, yeah, it's a async enabled, so they can do stuff really fast. Python, not so good. Um, even though we've now got async and await in Python, well as of quite a while ago, the gRPC stuff hasn't been updated to it, so we've got to do stuff in gRPC with threads. Um, luckily they have made the channels fully thread safe. Um, Google's handled doing all that, so that otherwise would be another non-trivial thing to implement, perhaps. Um, what do you mean Google's done that? Well, because this is a sort of Google, the whole using gRPC as the uh, oh, RPC yeah. server. 
Google's hand of making all the channels thread safe in Python. Um, the key is just to use the same channel for each thread. So if you've got one client object, basically it's only ever going to use one channel, so it's super easy to, to do threading. Um, so a threading example is quite useful to know because if if, uh, if we do get onto the hold invoice stuff in the workshop that we we're talking about, you saw how used had his three terminals going because those the two functions were were blocking. Um, until the invoice had been settled. So you might not want to block your entire program waiting for an invoice to be settled perhaps and uh, putting it sticking it in the thread is quite important. Um, so yeah, in this example you obviously just set up your, your thread target function um, and, and start the thread. It's pretty, it's pretty easy stuff. There's a couple of helper functions in the library. I'd like to add a lot more stuff like uh, like Alex Bosworth's one, which I've mentioned. But um, at the moment, there's just a few, like a channel point generator, which will take a funding transaction ID and an output index and return a, a channel point object to you. Um, there are a couple of other functions which take channel points as input, so I found this to be kind of useful. So like close channel method will take a channel point as input. Uh, update channel policy, I think, as well. Um, so yeah, uh, that can be useful. Also, the other one is to make a, a lightning address. Um, so lightning address, again, is, is doing a similar function, uh, but, but things like connect peer want to take a lightning address object itself. Um, although I have implemented another helper function, just connect, which uh, lets you write the, the pub key at IP address colon port string in quote like as you might expect to but um, in case you didn't want to use a custom function uh, then there's yeah, hex to bytes and bytes to hex and um, pack into channel backups I think this might be getting ironed out soon as well there's a there's a funny quirk with when you make a one of these static channel backups I don't know if you've heard of that you can kind of half back up your channels in LND now, not fully, but um, if you want to do the verify backup it doesn't work particularly well with the single backups that you can maybe export, so there's a small helper function in there if anybody gets into that stuff. Um, documentation wise, I've tried to document all the classes and methods with what I think is the useful bits of the information off, off that, mainly off that API. Um, the GRPC API guide, which was in the link earlier. They do make a lot of changes. There's quite a lot more of them than there is of me, so stuff might go out of date. So I'd recommend using not the doc strings, probably. Um, loop, which you touched on as well. It, the library supports loop, so there's a different client for loop, but if you've got the loop daemon running, you can now control your loop outs and probably one day your loop ends. Um, so that kind of stuff is all in there. I guess I probably don't need to go over loop because we've kind of talked about it. Um, yeah, it's about creating inbound capacity for the channel. So you, you send some funds out and off chain and they send you back some Bitcoin on chain in a trustless manner. But loop is, um, is supported. It does need some additional RPC servers to be enabled. I think these are now enabled by default in LND versions greater than 0.6, so maybe this instruction is kind of out of date for most people. I doubt there'll be too many using old versions of LND. Um, it uses some special build tags, basically. So then all you need to do is start the loop daemon, and um, yeah, you're, you're off and running. It's got its own proto file as well, um, and yeah, the import is it actually comes from a different package within the library, loop RPC. So you, instead of importing the client, you're from loop RPC importing the loop client. So it's pretty easy to use again. Um, that's got its own API documentation, which basically is in the exact same format as the the RPC stuff, but just for this loop. And loops enabled in your Python GRPC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's all it's all 
built in there. It's got um, it's all ready to go. You just need to loop itself is a separate program to LND, so you need to install loop as like a separate install. But you also need to have made what well, in historical versions you also need to have compiled LND with special tags. But I think they're all switched under. So um, there's a whole load of tests which are not in the pit package. Um, it spins up some reg test nodes, Bitcoin and LND. Um, I mention them not because they're interesting, they're not, they're quite boring. Uh, they, <coughs> they fail quite a lot, but they do have good workflows in. So for stuff like the hold invoices and some of the send payments, if you can't work out how to perhaps do the whole workflow, then there's like some kind of an example in the tests. They can be kind of a good reference. Probably a verbose, very horrible example, but so like for channel backups, you can see here this is this is someone. Well, if you ignore the first couple of lines, it, it shows you how to make a backup, what, and then how you might verify that and um, restore from the backup as well. So just something to look into, and in, I guess in the future, if anyone's using it. Um, trivia again, not particularly necessary to go into in great detail. Well, one thing I have found is if you're switching between using LN CLI and doing stuff with a, with a Python library or perhaps one of the other RPC libraries, there can be lots of encoding differences. People doing stuff in base 64 and in hex. Um, and yeah, I found a few other rogue ones. So it can be quite easy just to stick in one RPC. Um, because LN RPC is actually, uh, LN CLI is actually still using the same gRPC, but they've kind of implemented it in Go, obviously. And, um, yeah, here's a, there's another example on here. If you, if you do add invoice for the uh, payment hash or the R hash, you can see that you get different, very different encodings. Uh, just something to watch out for. If, you, if you're trying to pass these two things into one another, they're obviously not going to work. Um, yeah, we talked about repeated messages at the beginning. Some things you get back, for example, if you do a list channels or virtually using list invoices, you might get back a, an object with a field that has a within that object has a repeated uh, message. And if you see if you are trying to debug stuff and you see this repeated composite container, you just normally need to go a level deeper. Um, but you can look at the API guide, like here's the cutout from the API guide. If you if you were just playing around, you would see that invoices is an array of invoices. So within there, I'd expect to find a, a list of invoices in Python. Um, that's kind of it for me on the presentation side. I've got a list of terms with which I might have skimmed over quite quickly, although we've now covered a lot of them today, um, with links that I think are good explainers of them. So they'll be at the end if anyone wants to look at any of them any further. And um, yeah, I think hopefully we can get back into the workshop and people's nodes will still be running. <laughs> and we can go try out like a load of this stuff and, uh, and make it seem easy, you know, and then, and then we'll know how to, how to program on top of LND, I hope. So, unless anyone's got any questions as well. I haven't asked yeah, that. Any questions, questions before going to the workshop? So, um, I'm always interested in uh, your experience of building with LND. Um, it's good, I think. This, um, particularly, I think this, this gRPC stuff makes everything pretty solid in terms of communicating with LND. Obviously, it's still a, a beta software itself, so some stuff is not perfect with it. But uh, in terms of yeah, using like a, a library like this, or, or like some of the other ones in the other languages. Tested out a few others. I, I generally don't find many problems with them. So I'd say it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. And did you say there's a competing Python gRPC library? There, I believe there's two. Interesting. Yeah, competing libraries are available. One of them has actually used a, a sort of async wrapper to try and emulate some asynchronous type of layer around all the RPC calls. I think it's a bit of a hack. I think it does work though, but it is definitely quite a lot of a hack. Um, and anyway, my understanding of, of threads, especially of like, you know, low computational threads like these, is you can get like up to 10,000-ish 
going maybe with decent hardware, not, not in too much danger. I think that's the sort of order of magnitude, I could be off by one. But, um, so I don't think threads are particularly a problem if you're for most applications. Anything in those libraries that you'd like to make change to uh, integrate into yours? or? I think just uh, better tests and more helper functions. I mean, I really would recommend checking out Alex Bosworth's Just version cool. of the library because all, everything I've got is a sort of small subsection of everything he's got in there. He's got lots of nice tools for decoding invoices and manipulating stuff, you know. Um, it's really it's good to look at. That's in JavaScript, right? Yeah. I think it's JavaScript. I hope so, no. I've said it a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> if you say it enough times, it's true. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we'll end, okay, we'll end the Q&A, we'll do the workshop. Cool. cool. Thank you very much.